Let's go to the beginning. How did the American Civil War start and why? So the American Civil War starts because of our flawed institutions. The founders uh, had mixed views of slavery, but they wanted a system that would eventually work its way toward uh, opening for more people of more kinds. Uh, not necessarily equality, but they wanted a more open democratic system. But our institutions were designed in ways that gave disproportionate power to slaveholders in particular states in the Union through the Senate, through the Electoral College, through many of the institutions we talk about in our politics today. Therefore, that part of the country was, in the words of Abraham Lincoln, holding the rest of the country hostage. For a poor white man like Abraham Lincoln, born in Kentucky, who makes his way in Illinois, slavery was an evil, not just for moral reasons. It was an evil because it de denied him democratic opportunity. Why would anyone hire poor Abe to do something if they could get a slave to do it for free? An economy of, of opportunity for him had to be an economy that was open and that did not have slavery, particularly in the new states that were coming into the Union. Lincoln was one of the creators of the Republican Party, which was a party dedicated to making sure all new territory was open to anyone who was willing to work, any male figure who would be paid for their work. Free labor, free soil, free men, basic capitalism. Southerners, Southern plantation owners were an aristocracy that did not want that. They wanted to use slavery and expand slavery into the new territories. What caused the Civil War? The clash and our institutions that were unable to adapt and continued to give disproportionate power to these Southern plantation slave owners. The Supreme Court was dominated by them. Senate was dominated by them. And so the Republican Party came into power as a critique of that. And Southerners unwilling to accept, Southern Confederates unwilling to accept that change, went to war with the Union. So who was on each side, the Union and Confederates? What are we talking about? What are the states? How many people? Uh, what, what's like the the demographics and the dynamics of uh, of each side? The Union side is much much larger, right? In terms of population, I think about twenty two million people, uh, and it is uh, what we would today recognize as all the states uh, basically uh, north of Virginia. The South is the states in the s south of the Mason Dixon line, so s Virginia and there on south, west through Tennessee. So Texas, for example, is in the Confederacy, Tennessee's in the Confederacy, uh, but other states like Missouri are border border states. And um, the, the Confederacy is a much smaller entity. Uh, it's made up of about 9 million people, plus about 4 million slaves. And uh, it is a agricultural economy, whereas the Northern economy is a more industrializing economy. Interestingly enough, the Confederate states are in some ways more international than the Northern states because they are exporters of cotton, exporters of tobacco. So uh, they actually have very strong international economic ties, very strong ties to Great Britain. Uh, the United States was the largest source of cotton to the world before the Civil War. Egypt replaces that a little bit during the Civil War. Uh, but all the English textiles were uh, American cotton from the South. And so uh, it is the southern half of what we would call the eastern part of the United States today with far fewer people. It's made up, the Confederacy is, of landed families. Wealth in the Confederacy was land and slaves. The northern United States is made up predominantly of small business owners and then larger financial interests, such as the banks in New York. And what about the military? Who are the people that picked out guns? What are the numbers there? So the, the, the Union also outnumbered the Confederate. Uh, by far, but it, this is a really interesting question because there's no conscription in the Constitution. Uh, unlike most other countries, our democracy is formed on the presumption that human beings should not be forced to go into the military if they don't want to. Most democracies in the world today actually still require military service. The United States has very rarely in its history done that. It's not in our Constitution. So... Um, during the Civil War, in the first months and years of the Civil War, Abraham Lincoln has to go to um, the different states, to the governors, and ask the governors for volunteers. So the men who take up arms, especially in the first months of the war, are volunteers in the North. In the South, they're actually conscripted. And then as the war goes on, 
the a union will uh, pass the Conscription Acts of 1862 and 1863, which for the first time, and this is really important because it creates new presidential powers, for the first time, Lincoln will have presidential power to force men into the army, which is what leads to all kinds of draft riots in New York and elsewhere. But suffice it to say, the Union Army throughout the war is often three times the size of the Confederate Army. What's the relationship between this uh, no conscription and people standing up to fight for ideas and the Second Amendment? A well-regulated militia being necessary to the security of a free state, the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. We're in Texas. Yeah, yes. So, What's the role of that? Uh, in, in this story. The American population is already armed before the war. And so even though the Union and the Confederate armies will manufacture and purchase arms, it is already an armed population. So uh, the American presumption going into the war is that citizens will not be for forced to serve, but they will serve in militias to protect their own property. And so the Second Amendment, the key part of the Second Amendment for me as a historian is the well-regulated militia part. The presumption that citizens, as part of their civic duty, do not have a duty to join a national army, Prussian style, but are supposed to be involved in defending their communities. Uh, and that's that's the reality. It's also a bit of a myth. Um, and so Americans have, have, throughout their history, been gun owners. Not AK-47 owners, but gun owners. And gun ownership has been for the purpose of community self-defense. The question coming out of that is, what does that mean in terms of, do you have access to everything? Uh, Antonin Scalia, even himself, asked this question on the Supreme Court. You know, he said uh, in one of the gun, gun cases, uh, you have the right to defend yourself, but you don't have the right to own an Uzi. <laughs> You don't have the right to have a tank. I don't think they'd let you park a tank, Lex, in your parking spot, right? Actually, I looked into this. I think I think there's a gray area around tanks, actually. <laughs> I, I think you're legit allowed to own a tank. Oh, you really? I think there's, well, somebody look into this. Cause somebody told me, but I could see like that, because it's very difficult for that to get out of hand. <laughs> right, right. Okay, I mean, there may be one guy in a tank. That you could be breaking laws in terms of the width of the vehicle that you're using to operate. Um, anyway, that's that's a hilarious discussion. But so then to make the case, speaking of AK-47s and rifles, and back to Ukraine for a second, one of the fascinating social experiments that happened in Ukraine at the beginning of the war is they handed out guns to everybody, rifles, and crime went down, which I think is really interesting. Yeah. I hope somebody does a, a kind of psychological data collection analysis effort here to try to understand why. Because it's not obvious to me that in a time of war, if you give guns to the entire populace, anyone who wants a gun, it's not going to, especially in a country who has historically suffered from corruption, mm -hmm. not result in robberies and assaults and all that kind of stuff. There's a deep lesson there. Now, I don't know if you can extend that lesson beyond wartime though. Right, that's the question, what happens after the war? I mean, my inclination would be to say, that can work during war, but you have to take the guns back <laughs> after the war. <laughs> but they might be very upset when you try to that's take the, the problem. Guns back. No, that's precisely the problem. That That's actually part of the story here. I mean, what happens after the Civil War, after Appomattox in 1865, is that many uh, Southern soldiers go home with their guns mm -hmm. and they misuse their weapons uh, to, quite frankly, shoot and intimidate uh, former slaves who are now citizens. And this is a big problem. I talk about this in the book in Memphis in 1866. Uh, it is former Confederate soldiers and police officers and judges who are responsible for hundreds of rapes uh, within a two-day period and destroying an entire community of African Americans. And they're able to do that because they brought their guns home. But underneath, underneath the issue of guns there is just the fundamental issue of uh, hatred and uh, inability to see uh, other humans in this in this world uh, as having equal value Fair. as another human yeah. being.